Hey folks, this is JR with DIY Prepper. Welcome to the channel. As preppers, one of the most important things for us to take care of is our food storage. And if you're somebody who's well off enough that you can go out and spend thousands of dollars on a one-year food supply for you and your family, then that's awesome, but that isn't most of us. The vast majority of preppers, myself included, have to build out our food storage over time. That'll allow us to add to our reserves as finances allow, and eventually if you keep at it, you should end up with a pretty substantial food supply. But as you build your food storage, you want to be intentional how you go about doing that because storing the right foods at the right times will help you get through both short-term and long-term disasters a little easier. If you're a new prepper and literally don't have anything else, then a good place to start is just a three-day food supply. This shouldn't be too expensive, so it should be attainable for most people, and it'll be a big confidence booster once it's taken care of. But before you get into that, it might seem obvious, but you do need to ask yourself, how are you going to prepare the food that you store? Many inexpensive foods like beans and rice that normally comprise the backbone of most preppers' food storage plants must be cooked before they're consumed. Raw rice, for example, contains a protein that the human body cannot digest and it could also have bacteria present. Red kidney beans are known to have toxic compounds that can only be eliminated by cooking. But even if you don't have a way to cook off-grid yet, you still have some options because many foods are completely safe to eat without any sort of preparation. Peanut butter has a ton of protein and other nutrients and can be eaten by itself or with some crackers. Canned fruits taste great straight out of the can and then other things like canned vegetables, meat, soup, and chili are all safe to eat because they've been cooked already. Jerky is another option, although it can be pretty expensive even in smaller quantities and it doesn't have as long of a shelf life as some other options. But if we're talking about a three-day food supply, you can get by on the kinds of foods that I just mentioned. They may not fill you up like other things, but in all honesty, you're not going to starve to death in three days anyway. What these are going to do is they're going to give you something to put in your body to help keep it running, and then also help you think a little more clearly. But of course, you could always expand what you can store by just picking up an inexpensive cooking tool. Small burners like this one just screw onto the top of a propane bottle and can be used to heat things up, boil water, or even cook if you have a skillet. You can also pick up cheap butane stoves for around $25 or $30, although they won't be able to produce as much heat as their more expensive counterparts. Having those along with an adequate water supply will allow you to store some prepper staples like dried beans and rice. And while you can get away with not having a way to cook for your three-day food supply, I do strongly recommend picking one up before you move on to the next stage, which is a one to two week supply of food. And when you start thinking about a one to two week supply of food, this is a really good time to start building up your reserves of foods that are shelf stable and can be stored long term. Beans and rice are popular because they can be stored for 20, 25 years in mylar bags with oxygen absorbers and they're pretty cheap but you shouldn't depend totally on beans and rice for your food storage. Because if those are the only things that you're eating, your body's gonna miss out on other things that it needs, and it'd also be really bad from a morale standpoint. Freeze-dried meals are a good way to supplement those more inexpensive options. While most people probably can't afford to go out and buy like a year's supply of that stuff, even if you're able to eat it like once every few days or once a week, it could still make a pretty big difference. And a good place to pick those up is Shields, and I like to thank them for sponsoring today's video. Shields is an employee-owned all-sports retailer with 30 locations in 15 states. They sell all the big brands from pretty much any sport or outdoor activity that you can think of, and that also includes freeze-dried meals from companies like Mountain House, Peak Refuel, and others. So if you think you may want to pick up some freeze-dried meals or anything else sports or outdoor related, then be sure to check them out. And aside from giving you more variety in your diet, another big advantage that freeze-dried meals have is that they're very easy to prepare. All you need to do is boil the right amount of water, mix it in with your food, and you're good to go. If you have something like this jet boil flash, then you could have your water boiled and food ready in around 10 to 12 minutes, which is much faster than trying to cook beans or rice. And one thing that's nice about the pouches in particular is that many times you could just pour your water straight into them. So that's going to prevent you from having to dirty up your cooking container, and they're also easy to dispose of since you can just press them down flat. When I first started prepping, Mountain House meals were kind of my go-to when it came to long-term survival foods, but there are some other good options out there as well. 
Peak Refuel tends to have more calories and protein in their meals, both of which would be very beneficial in survival situations where you're having to do more physical activity or under high levels of stress. Having higher quantities of those will help keep your body going and also help you think more clearly. But the best advice I can give you when thinking about stockpiling freeze-dried foods is to just go ahead, buy a few pouches of each one that you want to stockpile, and then cook them up, you eat them, you let your family eat them. Because the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of money on expensive food that nobody really wants to eat, or maybe it's a situation where you do enjoy eating it, but your body really does not enjoy digesting it. That unfortunately is something that I've had some experience with. We won't go into that right now, but those are the kinds of things that you want to figure out before a disaster is going on. Then another thing to remember about storing dry goods and freeze-dried food is that you'll need water to prepare them. So as you're building up your food storage, be sure to increase your water storage at the same time. Then aside from your long-term storage staples and freeze-dried foods, you want to continue to add canned goods to your one to two week supply of food. The good thing about those is that they can serve as very quick and easy to prepare meals and side dishes, and they'll give even more variety to your diet. You can also store things like flour and cornmeal, but just be aware that these won't last nearly as long as other dry goods. You may only get around like five years of storage out of them, even if they're in good Mylar bags with oxygen absorbers. Another thing that's similar to these that I like to store is corn masa, which is primarily used to make tortillas. Then after you have your one to two week supply of food taken care of, the next stage is a one month supply of food. And when you're doing this stage, the goal here is even more variety. While you do want to add to things that you already have, you also want to try to incorporate some different food items in this as well. Instant mashed potatoes are a very good option and they're one of my favorite long-term survival foods. If stored properly, they can last for up to 20 years. Quinoa is another good option since it's high in copper and magnesium, and it's also a good source of fiber and protein. Then if you haven't done so already, start stocking up on different kinds of spices because those can go a long way towards making your meals more enjoyable. At this stage, you may also want to pick up some manually powered kitchen tools as well. A grinder like this one will allow you to process meat and other food items, and a manually powered grain mill will allow you to turn things like wheat berries and dry corn into flour and cornmeal. And that's very beneficial if you want to store a lot of food long term, since raw grains are going to store for a much longer period of time than pre-ground flour and cornmeal will. Another thing that you want to address during your one month stage is to have sustainable cooking methods. Storing enough man-made fuels like butane and propane can get expensive, there might be space constraints, and it could also present some safety concerns. Picking up a couple of cooking methods that rely on natural resources like rocket stoves or some sort of solar cooker would be a good idea. I've covered off-grid cooking methods on my channel several times already, so I'm not going to go too much into that, but if you want to see one of those videos, then I'll be sure to put a card at the end of this one. Then after you have a one month supply of food, start to shoot for three months and beyond. And when you're at this stage, your goal should be to continue to add to your basics, add more variety, but also go for long-term sustainability. Because if we're dealing with a situation that lasts three months, there's a very good chance that it's going to last much longer than that. And in that case, you need to be able to procure additional food as the opportunity presents itself. One of the best ways to do that during a long-term disaster is to grow it yourself in a garden. Having a good variety of heirloom seeds and some good quality gardening tools are good places to start. However, having these is just the first step. You need to know how to use them, and in all reality, you probably should start learning how to garden during the earlier stages of food storage as well. One of the biggest things you need to know is what crops grow best in your area and when to start them. One of the best ways to figure that out is just by talking to experienced experienced gardeners in your area and then also just through your own trial and error. You may also want to experiment with different ways of growing plants so that you can get the greatest yields possible. For example, if you're short on space, potato boxes could allow you to grow more potatoes without taking up a whole lot of extra square footage in your yard. 
Then cold frames can be used to start plants earlier in the year when it's still a little bit colder and also help you extend your growing season further into fall when temperatures start to drop. Hunting and fishing can be another good option, but I would not totally depend on it. Larger animals like deer would probably be hunted to the point of extinction if we were to experience a widespread long-term disaster. So start thinking of other animals that people might not be as quick to hunt. Squirrels could be a good option, but you do want to be careful eating those from populated areas since they may ingest harmful substances like lead, which may make them unsafe to eat. Where I live in Texas, feral hogs are a huge problem because they reproduce so quickly, but if we were to experience a long-term disaster situation and people needed to rely on them for food, that might end up actually saving a lot of people's lives. And when hunting and fishing for survival, don't just depend on sitting around with a rod and reel or rifle in your hand. Take advantage of things like animal traps, nets, and trot lines that can do a lot of that work for you while you're hunting or fishing somewhere else or doing other important survival tasks. Then another way that you can make your food supply more sustainable is to raise your own animals. And while most people will think that they can't do this because they lack space, many animals like chickens and rabbits don't require that much room and are fairly easy to raise. Rabbits in particular reproduce very quickly, so they could be a viable long-term source of protein, but you are going to need to eat other things so that you get the fats and carbs that you need into your diet, otherwise you're going to starve to death. Other animals like goats require a little more space, and if you have a homestead, of course, you could raise larger livestock as well. But once again, if you plan on surviving on your own for three months or more, you need to have a water supply that can handle that. 55 gallon drums and IBC totes are good ways to store water in bulk, and these can be incorporated into a rainwater harvesting system as well. And y'all, your water plan is actually even more important than your food plan because you can live longer without food than you can water. So if you want to see some water-related preps that you would need to survive a long-term collapse, then click here. Or if you want to see my family's water purification plan, then click here. Once again, I'd like to thank Shields for sponsoring this video. Thank y'all for stopping by. Y'all have a good one.